is Rory O'Toole. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. Today we're discussing minimalism. Is stuff standing between you and what's really important? Join us as we do a deep dive on the idea that less is more. So today we are talking about Dolly. No, we are not talking about Dolly. You're thinking about Dolly obsessively. I think it's the most brilliant thing. I did like your tweet about how it's like dreams. It's only interesting to the people who had them slash created them. Yes, you're not. It's not so interesting to see other people's Dollies as it is your own, because part of it is the element of surprise or the the discord the dissonance between what you expected the ai would generate based on your prompt this is a software that you type in a sentence you can type in for example ramona singer riding a dinosaur and it will use this incredible technology to create an a, an image of that many Good images image of that yeah, it gives you nine options. Nine images, yeah. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's imperfections. It's not what... perfect. No shit. Anyone who's seen them knows it's not perfect. But it is remarkable, and its imperfections um, are what make it haunting and surprising and beautiful. I've I find great beauty in it. Well, I um, like the ones that you do of me, redhead kissing ghost of Abraham Lincoln. Yes, if I want to make it of Rory, I have to either type redheaded girl or Bryce Dallas Howard. <laughs> the Bryce Dallas Howard one kissing Abe Lincoln was really funny to me. Yes. Because it was and about me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I'm actually, I think I'm pretty good at making ones that are accessible to, I also think I'm good at telling dreams. Well, I am tickled by how tickled you are from it that i find really it makes me radiate joy that you're radiating joy from the dolly i mean i want to get the one of gay jews on the moon (laughs) i want to like i like it has this capacity to create these fantasy worlds these utopias i mean that's such an improv prompt we need a prompt from the audience (laughs) gay jews on the moon (laughs) I know, but it really, it really has beauty. It really looks like a Chagall painting. Mm. But oh, it got you know that's an astute observation. It kind of yeah. does. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, floating through space with a goat. I saw I saw <laughs> a tweet yesterday that was that said Chagall really captured the Jewish experience, floating through space with a goat. <laughs> I spent so long today trying to get it to make Trump as like the drawing of Rose from Titanic. Really? It couldn't do that? It couldn't do it. It couldn't Mm. figure it out. Okay. It got Trump next to a drawing of the Titanic. Maybe next to the drawing of a rose. (laughs) With a rose. (laughs) I saw it got him to be like with Rose on the Titanic, on the deck of the Titanic. (laughs) Okay, well... That has That's... nothing to do with the topic we're about to discuss today. <laughs> um, it neither goes along with it nor contradicts it. Today we are talking about minimalism. I think we're going to be talking about it both as a lifestyle and also an aesthetic. So if you live a minimalist aesthetic, you definitely live a minimalist lifestyle. But if you live a minimalist lifestyle, you don't necessarily have to have the aesthetic. Um, I actually think that you can live a minimalist aesthetic without living a minimalist lifestyle. I mean, a A hundred basic white tees. Yeah. And like a sleek white condo and 
you know, lots of surfaces and big windows, you know, and a low bed. Yeah. Well, why don't you talk about, why don't we talk about you, you, you go ahead and say, what is minimalism? So our main text that we looked at today is this movie called The Minimalist. Less is now. Do not Um, recommend watching it. (laughs) Not Not a good documentary. No. And they, so these two guys who made this documentary, they also did a Ted talk. They've written a number of books. Everything they do is the same right down to like some of the same, like they repeat lines and it's very, there's something just wretched about them. Like, you know, I hate them. They're such tools, right? Um, they definitely are tools, but they like really go into their sob stories in the minimalist documentary, which made me feel oh, great. Brother. Really felt great. <laughs> or they're so filled with pathos. Like you, your, your, your mouth is agape at me. You feel <laughs> like I'm a tool myself for thinking, for feeling sympathies for them. I can't believe you. I can't believe it elicited a feeling. Um, but that guy has such an interesting shaped head. I've never seen a head like that. It's truly one of a kind. <laughs> and for a reason, <laughs> I might add. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, they are, listen, yes, they're, they are not impressive people, are they? No, they, I mean, in terms of like their thought, they're not, you know, it's very shallow what they're basically saying. It feels, and the documentary, it feels a little manipulative to me too. Like they are, I think, trying to convert people. The whole thing feels very religious to me. Absolutely. I discovered minimalism and it fixed everything in my life. Truly. Truly, that is the the narrative. It fixed everything in my life. This is the thing. They are preaching to the choir. I fully agree with what they're saying about our consumer culture. Mm -hmm. And yet, even when they already have me as someone who like agrees with the basic premise, I really disagree with how they present it. So, so they're like, we live in this world of excessive consumerism. Check. Yes, I agree with that. And you have to have less stuff, stuff that doesn't, quote, add value to your life. Okay, I agree with that. But the reason why we do that, they keep, is sort of this radical individualism. So I want to find my own idea of success, not what culture tells me. And I don't agree with that. I think that kind of go your own way individualism is our consumer culture. Ah, tell me how, why? Because, you know, we're just being sold these ways to identify ourselves all the time, all these different ways of being. Yeah. You think it plays into sort of like this egoic identity obsession we have. Yes, absolutely. And I don't think that the answer is to try and find your your own radical individualism outside of consumerism. I think it's to build a culture that actually has good values, because I think that we want culture to have values and we want to be moving together towards values in community in the in the shape of communities well actually i wanted to talk about communities because in the documentary you know they had some um other people talking and i think this person there's another talking head an expert on minimalism i don't remember what he was he was older white yeah beard maybe he was didn't have a beard maybe he was bald i don't know (laughs) i think he was bald and had a beard i I am getting a dolly vision in my head of him (laughs) (laughs) Very blurry. Um, And he was like, people didn't used to be obsessed with stuff. They didn't look for stuff to define them. They looked for community to define them. And I actually take issue with that. I don't think that's necessarily true because, you know, I read a lot of old literature, uh, old literature. um, 
And people have always been obsessed with stuff and status and how stuff gives you status, whether they were part of a strong community or not. Yeah, that's true. But the literature that we're reading, the old literature that we're reading is sort of like the 19th century bourgeois novel about someone trying, which often is about someone trying to raise their status. Like that's kind of the seed. Of the beginning of consumerism, you think? Yeah, I think like a classic Dickens book, not just Great Expectations, but certainly Great Expectations, also David Copperfield. It's about making your way in the world. It's about social climbing. Yeah, exactly. Vanity Fair, Pride and Prejudice also. Of not- course, all of Jane Austen novels are have many characters in it that are, you know, I mean, status is like the whole, is the great theme of Austen, right? And most of Dickens. And, you know, later on, Edith Wharton. Yeah. I mean, I, um, Pride and Prejudice, not a, not a love story, if you ask me. What do I think is the most important line in that book? Oh, to be mistress of, of all, all of this. this. Yeah. She rolls up. She's been so rude to Mr. Darcy. Not interested. Is she interested in him? No. Then she rolls up to his house and she goes, hot damn. <laughs> And then she starts singing a different song about mm. Mr. Darcy. Uh huh. Um, but I guess this, yeah, I mean, consumerism, when did it begin? It's certainly a huge part of like the modern life. And I feel very put upon by it. I feel like a active participant in it. Absolutely. I'm wondering if you do, because you actually don't own a lot of stuff. Well, okay. So when I look around my room, I actually like do not. They're like, you should take the minimalist challenge, throw away one thing on the first day, two things on the second, three on the third for a whole month. That would empty out my room completely. There would truly be nothing left. I don't think I have a lot of wasted items, but I do think that um, I am addicted to the point of sale. I love clicking buy now. I love buying a $4 coffee. It makes me feel like I'm rewarding myself. And that same coffee, if you gave it to me for free, it wouldn't, it's like, I get this dopamine release from, from spending that money and it's swiping that plastic, swiping that plastic, my little share Horowitz over here. Yeah. So I used to think (laughs) that like, because I don't have a lot of money or stuff that that meant I don't have an issue with uh, like overspending or consumerism. And then I realized you can actually have this issue at any at any scale. It's a scalable issue and you can have it. You can have the poor person's version. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's a, I think. And you could have the sparse about, version. You have the sparse version and the poor person's version right now. Mm-hmm. What's the sparse version? You live sparsely. I mean, poor yeah. people can have a lot of stuff. They say that in the documentary and in um, real life, you know, we know that, you know. Yeah, you're right. You can and and rich people can have clean surfaces, uncluttered spaces. But yeah, I think that you, I think what it's really about for me, and I I actually don't think this is what it's about for them. I think for them, it really is about like the number of objects in your place. For me, it's more about like the relationship to money and spending and, you know, using it to satisfy emotional needs that it's not actually like equipped to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you do love to have the little treat. I love a treat. And you love, love to buy books. I love to buy books. Books are such a cumbersome object to carry around with you in life. They are. And, you know, a lot of them end up in my dad's attic, which is very not, you know, that's very not minimalist. And that's very not Marie Kondo. Marie Kondo we didn't explicitly read for this podcast, but she she's here with us in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, she, I don't think she would describe herself as a minimalist. Maybe she would, but it's more about um, only having objects, obviously, that you use and or spark joy. Yeah, so I want to ask There's you- There's definitely the emotional component with Marie Kondo. It doesn't have to, like, which I didn't get from this minimalist documentary, it's not like they're not keeping around sentimental items at all. It seems like. I'm not sure about, 
about they that. don't mention anything about sentimental items. No, they don't. They don't talk about that. He did talk about keeping things that add joy. He didn't I don't use remember that. that, but he did. He he used it at one point. That wasn't the regular phrasing that he used, though. The their main so, and I, I actually think it's an interesting thing to compare. Marie Kondo says, "If it doesn't spark joy, get rid of it," and they say, "If it doesn't add value, get rid of it." And I'm wondering what you think about these two phrases. I mean, add value, obviously I'm going to be have gun shy about or uh, my instinct is to be opposed to it because it just sounds so corporate. You know, it sounds so like capitalist consumerism, like adding value, almost like a math school, math equation, you know, like. Mm -hmm. I'm part of like an algorithm of, you know, having optimizing my life, having the most um, fulfilling experience. And we're going to put this into a little equation. I think is um, something I would be more inclined to, but I also have my issues with Marie Kondo (laughs) too, because I just feel like it's an oversimplification I also feel like with Marie Kondo, it's so much more of a focus on getting rid of stuff as opposed to not acquiring new stuff. Now, I read the Marie Kondo Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up book a number of years ago. I got rid of a ton of stuff, a a few items I had to buy back when I realized that I actually wanted them. Like what? So, and I have a prop today. This is one of the items that I I can't believe I got rid of. I thought I was done with it in life. I was not done with it. This it's the sex in the city kiss and tell book. Um, Now I was reading this just yesterday because it was Shabbat and, and I, you know, I, I do my darndest not to use tech on Shabbat. Sometimes I'm guilty of giving you a call, but I was reading this on Shabbat yesterday. And after all these years of having it, even with that little break in between when it was condoed, Um, I still am learning new stuff. I don't think I ever read the Aiden page before. So listen to this, okay? I think you'll find this fascinating. Men and women are different species. We are never going to understand each other fully. John Corbett said that. Wow, he's a real men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Yes, but that's that's by the way. So here's what I really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should read that book for this podcast, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and watch a little bit of Home Improvement. (laughs) Talk about that kind of male-female relationship. Uh (laughs) That would be great. So, so, and just like that, the Sex and the City reboot um, is bringing back for its second season, Che Diaz, the um, much reviled by America um, new partner of Miranda Hobbs, who's yes. also become a bit reviled by America. Now, you would think after the sort of unanimous outpouring of hatred that um, Michael Patrick King would want to maybe lose this character, find an elegant way to write them out. No, he he's doubling that. down, doubling down. He's doubling down. So. I, this is what I read. He's like, yeah, he's doubling down. He, he will not be swayed. So this is what I read on the Aiden Shaw page. And I think this is so interesting. So fans took note and soon HBO was bombarded with miniature chairs and other pieces of furniture. When Aiden left the show, fans sent in little pieces of furniture. Wow. I love, how did these campaigns get started before the internet? That's another topic for another day, but. I have no I mean, like how I, they saved Roswell with little Tabasco bottles. That was way before the internet took off. Anyway. This was internet. But it's like 2002? Happened, yeah, this is so this happened on Corbett's fan site. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it it's the internet, but it's not our internet. <laughs> not this internet. So then Michael Patrick King writes... We had already made a decision to keep John on, recalls Michael Patrick King, but it was really good validation. The fact that he specifies that, listen, fans, don't you th- don't you dare believe that you have a say in this show. 
Absolutely. Because, you know, when he came out and said Che was coming back, it's because he said the audience didn't like Che because we were too scared of them. They made us too uncomfortable. It's the audience's fault. It's not the fact that they created one of the stupidest, cringiest, (laughs) most obnoxious characters in TV history. It can't be their fault. Can't be their fault. So even back in the day, he wanted to know, and this reminds me of the Saudi prince, Mohammed bin Salman. You know, he, there were all these women activists in Saudi Arabia um, agitating for the right for women to ride a bike. Oh. And he granted it to them, but then he imprisoned the activists as if to say, I make the calls here. I'm not doing this because you protested. Don't forget that this is an absolute monarchy. So I, you know, not to compare Michael Michael Patrick King to a (laughs) wicked um, dictator, but, you know, it's the same kind of tactic. Like, I, you know, don't think that you can sway us with your little chairs. How rude. Anyways, that book is a, a font of new insights. I can't believe I ever got rid of it. And that's the thing. I don't, you know, I don't feel oppressed by by stuff. I, I, I like having things. I like having books that I can revisit. I do see that there's a huge issues with our consumer culture. Well, talk about those, but I feel deeply oppressed by stuff at certain points in my life. Like I live in this small apartment um, with my boyfriend and two cats and he loves to buy stuff. He has a ton of stuff. And his answer to us buying stuff is just getting shelves and like putting the stuff on these open shelves. Yeah. That's... <laughs> like how many bamboo <laughs> kitchen spoons can a human have? But of course this is me projecting onto him. It's not like I'm a monk myself, you know, living with my one bowl and one um, kimono. I have two kimonos, for example. I probably only really need one. Oh, two kimonos. <laughs> So sometimes the stuff, it like really caves in on me. You know, I feel really like claustrophobic by it, but nothing sounds more dreary than a day cleaning out my stuff. I'll tell you that much. So I'm never motivated to do that because I don't want to waste my um, precious free time. Your precious and wild life. Yeah. The idea of like Sam and I spending a weekend getting rid of stuff. And then I come to the ultimate problem I have, what to do with my stuff, because now a lot of my stuff is clothing or shoes. And when I try and get rid of the clothes, I don't know what to do with them because now we all know the, that these clothes that we give to Goodwill or we put in a donation bin just get thrown away. Um, So it's like, people recommend like sustainability people are always like, you should try and sell your clothes because then, you know, they're going to be worn or like give them to a friend. So then I just end up keeping my, basically I keep my own trash to not put the trash in the world. Like it's still trash. Okay. But now you're, you're living in the landfill. Exactly. But now I am the landfill. Let me help you see this another way. Just throw it out. Just throw it in the trash. Okay. I'm going (laughs) to, I'm going to be a real devil here and just throw it away. You're right. I know. I know. It's It's not a lot of stuff. Or you know what you can do? And this is a tie in to another book we read for the podcast is um, we read Cheryl Mendelson's cleaning guide. Not sure if that podcast will make it. We'll see the light of day. But we did. We did read it. Make rags, Roar. Make rags. Cut those garments into squares and make rags. Sorry, I'm like literally recording this podcast in my closet, looking at the clothes and being like, would this <laughs> polyester plissé blouse make a good rag? I don't think so, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, But I think that there's another component to, there's two sides to minimalism. There's paring down your stuff. And then there's stop getting new stuff. And I almost find that even harder. Well, what are your, like, what are you buying? Like, you know, what is so funny is, um, and, you know, we did our whole internet social media episode, how to do nothing. Um, And I don't know if this made it onto there, but the internet and social media, I think one of the biggest 
you know, toxic relationship components of me and the internet. It's like, it makes me a consumer. So I watch a ton of makeup tutorials and I have bought so much makeup in the last two years, even though ironically, I've never worn less makeup in my life. Mm. Like I don't put on makeup every, every day by any means, but I'm like, I really want to have this fun eyeshadow set. And that's another thing that I think the minimalist documentary and minimalism in general sort of glosses over is, and they don't talk about how you buy it because it's fun. Yeah, the the thrill, the thrill of the hunt. And I remember once like it, being in this like delirium of like trying to save money, but really wanting to spend and just sort of going back and forth with myself about all these different things and feeling like I needed a treat, but not sure what to buy. And I was like, I'll buy someone a gift. Like that felt like a little cheat. And that's what made me realize that it really is about the thrill of the hunt for me. Because a gift, getting a gift will give me that same. And you know, I like to do a little buy now, get you a gift, you know, have a little something. And for me, getting you a little gift, it's the exact same thing as getting me a gift. Oh, interesting. You should do that more then. I get to click buy now. It's not entirely selfless. I'm getting a big dopamine hit from the from the the Amazon of it all. Yeah. Well, okay. What can we use to supplement it? Because that was one thing I really liked about how to do nothing was she kind of gave you an answer of what to do instead of looking at your phone. Was it a good answer? We don't know. But what is the answer? Well, there are other ways to have a treat. You can make yourself a treat at home. <sighs> Doing something? How dreary. How How is me doing <laughs> anything a treat? Yeah, I mean, no, th- that's the thing. I, I actually think that the real answer is you have to- Go without. You have to go without. You have to like yeah. shut down that part of your brain or like make it smaller, like you have shrink to it. it. Smaller. Well, I did see, watch this YouTube video um, of this woman who went a whole year without buying anything that wasn't like- a something she consumed and had to replace. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I thought that sounded like a really interesting idea. And I was like, I'm going to do that. And then I was like, okay, I need to buy $800 worth of stuff. So I have everything ready to start the year. That brings me to something I wanted to talk about. So that I, I I wrote down, I wrote down some notes about like a couple, um, what I consider to be like consumerist delusions, like modes of thought that lead us into this trap. And one of these, so needing a treat is one of them, Mm -hmm. but one of them is what I call the finishing the collection delusion. Yes, that I am deep in that delusion. I'm like, I just need one more blouse, one more pair of black sandals, two more pairs of work, you know? Yes. It's like, it's, it's, Purchasing to get out of purchasing, it's not entirely different from like, I'll just eat this whole cheesecake so it's out of the house, like that sort of diet culture trope. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's this idea that like, okay, look at your look at your wardrobe and figure out like where are the gaps? Go spend the money now. It justifies huge outputs of money. Absolutely. Um, and you know what? It doesn't work because then the next day you bend over, you split those pants uh, and, you know, you need a new pair of pants. The collection cannot actually be completed. It is uh, an ever retreating horizon. Absolutely. And I think that kind of goes into minimalist aesthetic, which is the, I I follow a lot of minimalist YouTubers and um, people on Instagram. And of course the idea with them is, you know, to have a very pared down wardrobe um, and to buy the highest quality items you can afford and have very few of those items. Right. But (laughs) the problem. so for me, someone who doesn't have a lot of like disposable income, you know, I'm trying to um, save for a retirement that will never happen. So I've got to work on that. (laughs) Um, Like a nice item would be from like Everlane or even like a nicer item would maybe, I mean, I buy a lot of my clothes used. That's a whole different genre, but like let's Everlane, the quality, my pants are still ripping at Everlane. Same as they are at Forever 21. I almost feel like the myth of quality is part of the myth of minimalism. 
My Madewell shoes do not last any longer, you know, than my um, Nordstrom Rack shoes. Yeah. I mean, there, I would say that there are like a few exceptions. To Listen, the if you can jump up to that next bracket, maybe that is the case. No, I actually don't think it's about that next bracket. I think it's about certain brands. Like, I think like a uh, uh, Levi's pair of jeans is like pretty durable. And I think that there's like certain, am I just like advertising for, am I caught in the trap of consumerism right now? Am I, mean, I, just like- I actually don't know if Levi's jeans last that long because Sam buys Levi's, used to buy Levi's exclusively and then stopped because they started ripping too quickly. <sighs> Okay, you know what? I'm just spouting some nonsense that I probably heard from a commercial. <laughs> Listen, you know, you could, what I guess I feel like it's almost even more random than that. Like you can get a good pair of jeans from Levi's. You can, but yeah. you might not all, you know, like the consistency isn't there because we're, they're like producing on such a mass scale. Like people always shit on Forever 21 and for good reasons, yada, yada. But I have bought things from Forever 21 that have lasted years and years and years. And I have bought things from Everlane that lasted me, you know, three weeks, three months, probably more than three weeks, but. Is kind of a crapshoot. Like, and then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to buy from like smaller, let's do this differently. Let's buy from smaller brands that are like sustainably, they're sustainable. They get good B Corp ratings or whatever that is. I bought, it's like, confirms that you're it's like an independent confirmation that you're good um i bought a bunch of leggings from this place that's like that three months before rips in the crotch yeah you would have been better off buying from lula row and helping some poor woman (laughs) like a house foreclosure (laughs) And I could have gotten smiley face leggings that way, you know? No, I I wrote down this quote from comedian Sarah Silverman, which I love. The quote, which I, I, who I love and the quote I love. I think about this quote often because I'm quite interested in the void as a concept. Um, And she talks about the void. So she says, life has a gap in it. It just does. You don't go crazy trying to fill it in like some lunatic. Now. What I like about this and what I don't like about the minimalists, the, mm-hmm. the name of these dudes who, with their head shapes, who made this documentary, is that they believe that life has a void, life has a gap that can be filled. And it can Absolutely. be filled by minimalism TM. You know, like minimalism to them is very much like, it's not like a loose thing. It's like, this is a, for them, like a very specific approach to life and it will fill the void. And I actually think it's like, it's all about learning to sit next to this gaping void and just be like, and stop throwing stuff into it. Stop trying to, you know, um, it's, it's like that, that beautiful Solange song. I tried to drink it away. I tried to sex it away. I traveled 70 States you know, running, running away from it, throwing things into it like a lunatic. Yeah. Like you called me the other day and you were feeling the void more than usual. Like, and you said, Oh, I think I'm depressed. And I said, ain't you a human? I loved that response by the, yeah. I was like, am I depressed? Ain't you human? It's like, yeah. Oh yeah. I forgot. Like life isn't supposed to be all candies and roses all the time. Like who cares? Basically. Yeah. Who cares? Who cares? Your life will never feel totally like a circle with no hole in it. It'll never feel complete. It's a process and not an enjoyable one or a, <laughs> or a straight line one, you know? Um, and, and there are things it, we, we, we fill the gap with. And just, I hear people when they call me, my friends or whatever, just people when they're talking about their life and they're in, um, they're really feeling the void, let's say, and they're scrambling for things that'll make it fill the void. I just need to get, and I've been there too. I've been there too. Things I thought would fill the void. (laughs) Nature, (laughs) meditation, um, reading more, um, a boyfriend, 
um, therapy, deep excavation therapy, you know, these are all yeah. things I thought would like come, I would come up, re- be reborn totally without ennui mm-hmm. and spoiler alert, still have ennui sometimes. Yeah. And, and also in this, you know, ties right into this consumerism financial theme is like, so you try to fill the void with things that take money and time, but they don't fill the void. So you're still left with the void, but now you're broke also. How cruel, how how utterly sinister. So, Roar, I want you to pay attention. This is something I've been paying attention to. How many trains of thought end in a purchase? Let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. Not in an actual purchase. But I've been noticing that so many of my thoughts are like, wow, it's a beautiful day. I would like to go get a coffee. Or like, wow, it's a beautiful day. I would like to go for a hike. I should get a new water bottle. Like all these different thoughts that start with like an observation or a feeling, they start in all sorts of different places, a bit of knowledge, something I'm watching, something I see. Mm -hmm. It all flows just mentally. I'm not even talking about taking it to the online sphere yet or to an actual store, heaven forbid. It all flows to... I must purchase something. There's a purchase. This thought is a question and a purchase is the answer. Mm, Very interesting. I don't think I do that as much as some people because there are some people for whom accessories are key. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, so, and I'm someone for whom I'm like, let's see if I stick with this and then we'll get to the accessories. Gotcha. Do you know what I mean? I have, I I lost my beautiful water bottle that someone gifted me and I haven't bought a new one because I'm like, well, a cup is fine. I'll just use a cup. I'll just use a cup. Yeah. Well, that was something I was trying for a while. Is there something else in the house that can fulfill this purpose? But Mm -hmm. I kind of gave up on that as evidenced by my meditation chair, which I had ample other things that serve that purpose, but I really felt I needed it. You and wanted you know that what? meditation cushion so badly. I fought you so hard on buying it. Well, I bought it. And then you were like, what are you, what are you mad? And then I returned it. It was $50. I mean, this was like an expensive meditation chair. I returned it and I still wanted it. And when you would call it a chair, I feel like people are picturing a chair. It's, it's a pillow. Yeah. It's a little <laughs> It's a little uh, yeah. muffet. It's tuffet. a little cush- cushion. Yeah. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. It's filled yeah. with buckwheat. There we go. It's already sort of lost its luster and its appeal, but I do use it. <laughs> you use it. Yes. I. Here's the thing. I use it as much as I meditate. How often is that? Once, Once a week. week. <laughs> yeah. um, now, do you think you have kept using it just because of the discourse we've had around it? Yes. Like you're like, I have to keep using this to prove that I needed it. Yep. (laughs) That's, that is why, because let me tell you, a chair is more comfortable, but another one of the, the shopping delusions that really is effective for me is what I call the ultimate pant delusion. Oh yeah. You love the platonic ideal. You're finally going to get the right sock. Yes. The right (laughs) sock. This is the t-shirt. Here's the shoe. This is the pant. It's not completely, it's not utterly different from finishing the collection, but you know, you might be, it is different because you could say that like, you know what I'm missing is a wacky hat. And the ultimate pant delusion is not about that. It's about, it's about, you don't have to choose. We chose for you. (laughs) Well, this kind of goes into our next topic, which where we're going to get more into this minimalist aesthetic versus mm-hmm. sort of maximalism. That is kind of minimalist. Like it's all about buying the best pair of pants there. Yes. And mm-hmm. you're buying it in a shape and in a color 
that will last forever and is sort of above the trends. And of course, ironically, minimalism as a trend has been thriving in the last um, couple of years, hence the rise of minimalist brands like Everlane. You know, what's interesting is like the rise of wire cutter also. Oh, I actually don't really like wire cutters where they rank like appliances. Yeah, but it's kind of a place where you can go and there's a trusted voice saying like, this is the best. This this is is the the best best popcorn maker. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, it's it's a little bit similar to the ultimate pant. Well, because Um, there are so many options, I think that that's something that minimalism and the platonic ideal of the perfect um, good is fighting up, fighting against kind of like, let me take your hand and guide you through the onslaught of choices that you have. Now, when we, when you switch our gears for us rare. Yeah. So we're all there, you know, going along with minimalism as a lifestyle, it's kind of the minimalist aesthetic um, sort of being, I don't know if it was birthed from that, but they go hand in hand. It's this idea of, and we've touched on it before, buying fewer, higher quality things. And it is also sort of the way those things look. So mostly I think of it in terms of clothing and home decor. So I feel like for clothing, it really is like that minimalist 90s look, like a slip dress and a pair of boots, something very simple, sort of. Um, dainty jewelry the in buying it in neutral. So the idea is that it'll last longer. You won't get sick of it if it's in a neutral color and if it's sort of um, not an ornate or complicated design. And then I feel like the home decor kind of is very mid-century modern and it's the same idea um, there, which is that you're going to buy fewer things that you really want to showcase clean lines, um, neutral color palettes, um, you know, maybe like fun shapes is like a way that you could like show off that, um, aesthetic and it's not cluttered at all. It's everything has a place. Everything belongs somewhere. Um, and yeah, it's very popular. It has been that way for a few years. And now I think that, you know, the pendulum might be swinging the other direction. I think that the mid-century modern thing is only one iteration because there's also the sort of like Japanese low bed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there is, there's there's also more iterations to the clothing aesthetic too, but those sort of epitomize it to me. Or Scandinavian is another interior design aesthetic that's very popular with minimalism. Or like, you know, just like that, like hyper-modern, maybe this is the Scandinavian, but like the hyper-modern, like sort of like Carrie's new apartment and then just like that, the one she didn't keep with the beeping, like just like- Sleek. Yeah, a real- Glossy. Sleekness, whereas like, the Japanese iteration is maybe like a little less sleek. It's a little more matte, M-A-T-T. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and then with clothing, it's like the difference between buying a straight leg jean versus like a big, floody, baggy jean right now, which is more trendy. So another area where this aesthetic rules, in addition to home decor and fashion, is consumer electronics are like the... the the look of Apple products. Exactly. But I think that there's actually like this terrible maximalism to the internet and to our lives on our computers, this sort of like tangled mess of unorganized docs and downloads and emails and pictures and content and pornography. And we dress it up and news and just like the the internet is like this teeming sea of of color and violence and texture and hideousness and we we wrap it up in this like elegant paper thin um box a full computer you mean yeah and it's like 
it's actually a lie. We're lying to ourselves. Cause then you, okay. So like picture like the room of the minimalists, you know, mm-hmm. like sleek white, a couple like f- things in identical white frames on the wall. And then a little computer folded closed on, on a light wood desk. Oh, so cute. Like, so, so calm. So calm. And it's actually not because the computer hides an ocean it's of chum. there to shock your senses in every sense of the word. I mean, yeah, it's like how uh, my closet just gets stuffed with stuff and then I just close the door. It's exactly the same thing. Or like, okay, this drove me crazy. One of them had a salt lamp, a Himalayan salt lamp. Who's one of them? One of the minimalists. Oh, the people in the documentary, the dudes in the yeah. documentary, yeah. To me, like the salt lamp aesthetic is like, a, a real symbol of like the dissonance between the minimalist aesthetic and like the maximalist global globalized world that sustains that aesthetic. Like here in your little white room, you have this like lovely pink glowing lamp, but like it was mined it from like a salt mine and him, you know, it's just like, the well, I guess what you mean to say it and it's almost like you're saying it kind of annoys you that they front maybe someone who lives a minimalist lifestyle fronts as anti-consumer when like they still make ethically ambiguous purchases. Yeah. And that like, I think that the, yeah, the, the minimalist aesthetic hides conceals by way of the way it looks its yeah relationship to like a chaotic globalized consumer world and me that's true of everything it is it is but for some reason the minimalist aesthetic feels like complicit in in like creating some sort of sense of denial about that Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what's the answer really? It's like, it's, I mean, be, we could do a whole episode on being a responsible consumer. It's close to impossible. You know, who's into that is Mina Lee. <laughs> Mina Lee is into that. There's a lot of YouTubers who are into it, but, and I mean, okay, there, there, here are the answers that you'll get is like, buy only things you really need or really want and buy them secondhand. Right. But it gets a little more complicated when I you have to buy things like contact solution. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody's perfect in this. Nobody's not in the wheel of consumerism in this American lifestyle. Um, that is absolutely true. And it's a delusion. It's utterly delusional to think that there's any way out. There's no way out. <laughs> and any way out that you see is actually a way in. It's a trap. Well, yeah, it's like, should I buy glass or plastic? It's like the complicated algorithm that goes into deciding which is less harmful to the earth. Can we talk about the maximalist aesthetic? And now we talk about the maximalist aesthetic, which is sort of, you know, the pendulum swings, baby. And it's swinging the other way now to maximalism, and which it I- feels like a young, well, does it feel like a younger aesthetic? It does. Yes, it's giving grandma hoarder. And it's giving teenage girl. But also like, yeah, Sarah Lawrence, like uh, Sarah Lawrence professor, Upper West Side apartment. Oh, yeah, for sure. Plants, cats, books. Plants, (laughs) Plants, cats, cats, books. books. Candy dishes. (laughs) Candy dishes, yeah. Browns, oranges, like not not whites, not taupe. But what's maximalism? Well, I mean, I, I think it is what it sounds like but you know i've been more amenable to to a maximalist look lately perhaps because i have less space so more of my stuff is in the space but i've kind of been into piles and (laughs) fabrics and it's layers that's exactly what it is it's layers it's giving you know um six dusty blankets on an old ornate couch you know (laughs) the aesthetic is marie antoinette the aesthetic is hippie commune with 25 people living in there the aesthetic is nothing has a place where do i look on the wall there's so many guatemalan masks you know (laughs) (laughs) 
and, it's and, collecting and displaying, but not in a polished way by any means. It's not museum curated. Yes. And what Mina Lee, our, our YouTuber friend, <laughs> yeah. she's not our friend, but our beloved YouTuber says about maximalism, which she likes about maximalism, is that it it's actually, you have to do the work for it. You can't just buy a maximalist aesthetic in the way that you can sort of purchase. You can go to Muji and just get a, get your minimalist things and they're all there. Maximalism, you have to go out into the world and find those Guatemalan masks. That's true. You have to go to a flea market and you have to hold on to things. You can't throw them away. You it's best if you never move apartments or houses because that's when the real accumulation begins. <laughs> every, well, I mean- Every move is a uh, is a paring down, and I've had more apartments than years of my life, um, in in the past decade and a half at least. Um, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why I have so much stuff in this apartment. I haven't moved in six years. Yeah, it starts. I'm fucked. Next time I move, it starts to pile up. Um, but yeah, I, I've been enjoying a little, a little vignette in the it's apartment. A little... so funny because I'm looking at your room and it is so sparse compared to <laughs> mine. And you're like, I'm a maximalist, baby. Look at these twinkle lights. Mm-hmm. Well, look at, look, okay, <laughs> look at this look photo at this wall. Angle. Yeah, you have a photo, photo wall. wall. Look at those books. Wow, look at that also, Kleenex. No, if you want to see the Kleenex collection, it's over there. Do you see all those What's boxes? that chair? That is a chair, a folding chair that I use to do inverted push-ups. Oh, my little! And you I know. just leave it out in the room. <laughs> you have like a real gym, gym rat vibe in there. <laughs> One thing Mina Lee said in her maximalist video was kind of about how people you get to show your personality more. But you know, I can just see in like twenty years when ma- however long cycles change so quickly now it's trend cycle so maybe in just a few years people will be like no I like minimalism because you can I pare down my items and you can see one thing that really means everything to me as opposed to a bunch of crap you know like just these are just trends and I think they're they're to a certain extent always going on in tandem exactly I mean those Sarah Lawrence professors have had those apartments. Yeah, they've never changed them, you know. And I think certain minimalists are like, "No, I'm a minimalist forever," and certain ones were like, are just in it for the ride. Exactly. Yeah, and there's always been people, rich people, who love to have those sleek, yes, tops, absolutely leather couches. And then there's always been rich people that love to have a nice gold framed. Renoir, like those big gold Baroque curls, you know, and like a lot of fluffy pillows. And, you know, it's real maximalist, the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, busy. Very busy, not streamlined. Where do you look? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, that's an interesting topic minimalism and maximalism in houses of worship because it really does seem to go one way or the other yes yeah i mean catholics maximalists quakers minimalists yeah now like i used to go to a lot of synagogues in israel like orthodox synagogues that were very maximalist and i liked it little Mm. lamps and books and all sorts of stuff going on and very Mm -hmm. crowded sort of mystical feeling i feel like the um American sort of non-orthodox Jewish aesthetic is like a like a, a 70s modern building concrete concrete and like the Judaica of the reform world is also minimalist like colored glass sleek oh yeah new yeah new. good sound system it's not that the reform Judaism minimalism is not the same as the Quaker no, that's more like little cabin in the woods. Yeah. Benches. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's more Abraham Lincoln living in a log cabin I even, than yeah. Brutalism. Yes. The brute the Esther, the, the the Esther Rauschenbausch library at Sarah Lawrence. Yeah. That's sort of what 
what people in the 70s thought the future would look like or what a moon colony would look like. <laughs> they were they were right and they were wrong because we live in the world they built for us. So what I'm hearing from you is you want to be a ma- you're more into maximalism these days. Maxim maximizing. I think that I want to be less afraid of having piles and and colors. Mm-hmm. But I'm, you also want to consume less. I want to consume less and I think I'm I think I'm a minimalist at heart like I don't think that there's a lot of stuff that I like to have in my apartment. I do need to, I do need to work on this spending addiction though. Because... Well, you're still a rambling man though. You like you haven't settled down into a place that you'll be at for a while. I dress very, I would say I dress quite simply, right? Well, the, the thing is also is it's it's going with clothes trends. So like Y2K is back obviously in a big way. And that was extreme maximalism. Like looking back on it, I see it was all about accessory explosion. You know what I mean? You need a big gold belt. You need a fun fuzzy hat. You need <laughs> some earrings, bracelets, necklace, all that stuff. Maybe some hair jewelry as well. Um, but now that I am, so I live in Los Angeles, you know, everybody I see dresses like this now, when I go to like flea markets or things like that, like Y2K is, it used to be that everyone dressed like Kim Kardashian and I'd walk down the street and everyone was like fully made up and really, you know, bike shorts, but now it's going a different way. And everyone looks terrible to me because I, <laughs> thought that aesthetic you know that's the aesthetic of my awkward years which you know i'm hoping to leave sometime soon because fingers crossed um but that's the nice thing about getting older i think is that you don't have to follow trends anymore well you know you have a style more than you have do you know what i mean i well i have a slightly different theory about this that i've shared with you before which is that it's not that when you get older, you no longer follow trends. It's that the trends no longer follow you. Which is <laughs> to say that when you're young, when you're young and you're with it, it's not like you are like, hmm, um, right. bell bottom jeans are in. I'm going to go buy those. It's no, it's like, how does a bird know how to build a nest? It's like, it's just, it blooms from within you. You look at the bell-bottom jeans, they look good to you all of a sudden. You set, the trend is calling from inside the house. And that's what's so mysterious about it. And I so remember what that was like to, to wake up one day and to see something, to see a, a leg shape on a jean in a, in a new way. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm not in touch with it anymore. I, and so- you know, I, I have that same feeling. I look at what the kids are wearing and I'm like, it's just, you know, it, it's like, it's like seeing a language that you don't speak. It's like you recognize, you see the shapes of it perhaps more clearly than they do. Well, absolutely. I mean, there is a saying that like, if you were around for the first iteration of the trend, then you can't participate in the second time it comes around. (laughs) And I totally agree with that because I mean, there's just too much, (laughs) baggage tied to low rise jeans for me. I'll never be able to look at them with that naivety I had when I was trying to stuff my, um, muffin top into them, you know? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I did see a a young lass walking by my street in some very low rise jeans and she looked great. Oh, that's nice. Good for her. I mean, I think all the kids on euphoria look great too. Yeah, she she was so euphoria, this girl. <laughs> the thing is, is a lot of them to me don't look good. Like they look objectively adorable, cute young people. But like, I'm like, you look ridiculous in those like cargo low rise jeans with the whale tail coming out and like a crop top with a butterfly on them and a bucket hat. I'm like, this is. <laughs> it's chaotic. <laughs> it's. I, and you're right. Like, I don't have the eyes that they have. Like they're seeing with such different eyes. They're seeing something different. Yeah. So, <laughs> the thing that Mina Lee talks about is that like in the past, perhaps even in the recent past of the nineties, which isn't so recent anymore. Um, 
in a, a fashion aesthetic really sort of meant something about your affiliations in this world, socially, mm-hmm. artistically, and that that connection has been dropped. That, you know, to dress like a hippie does not imply anything about your your worldview. Yeah, that's um, fascinating to me because we would have called them posers. Posers. But the whole idea of the poser has really been deconstructed. Yeah, like they're like I, they've I can't believe that they've been able to let go of that chip on their shoulder these young people. Well, that, you know, when I talk to people who grew up in Gen X, I feel like that's the biggest ocean between us is that they see the world and this was so, so Gen X, a, such a Gen X belief. They see the world as divided into like authentic things and poser things. Mm-hmm. And it, I believe it was our generation, the millennials that really like presided over the, the, the breakdown between, you know, the poptimism craze, the idea that like, there's no difference really between high taste and low taste. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we did that. And I don't know if it's good that we did that or if it's bad that we did that. I'm agnostic, but it is a gulf between us and Gen X who, who really think that the poser exists and like that a, an entire genre of music can be sort of poserish. Whereas we're like, Ariana Grande is, you know, as good as Mozart, you know, I'm, like. I'm thinking about that because I almost feel like we had the concept of poser ingrained in us as well. But we definitely embrace pop music. I mean, I think when I was younger, so when we were younger, the poser thing was still sort of around. I remember telling my brother, Christina Aguilera writes all of her own songs, okay? Yes, and like, that absolutely. Was, that absolutely. was very important to me. She wrote Genie in a Bottle. <laughs> she wrote- <laughs> <laughs> and that's what makes it good. I remember um, he called her he called her pop and I was like, um, stripped is all about her stripping <laughs> that away. It's literally in the title of the album uh, that she is stripping her pop princess away. He didn't get it. He didn't get it. Yeah. Okay. So what are we saying? <laughs> we're, we're I think that Gen Z has totally done away with that. No, they poserism. They know, they know that they're, that the artists are products. Yeah. They know that they are products. Mm-hmm. And they're okay with it. <laughs> Except for their like wildly insane like rates of mental health issues. So they're not really okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. They're just crybabies. <laughs> they're not comfortable with the void. No. Or or they're too comfortable with it. I no, don't know. they're not comfortable with it. Yeah. They're not comfortable with being uncomfortable. But neither am I. So glass houses. Anyway, in conclusion, Matt, I think we've hit on some really good topics today and, you know, really unpacked um, quite a few themes around minimalism, maximalism. And is minimalism how to be? I'm going to say no. (gasps) Shock. And here's why. I actually don't think it's about how much stuff you have. I do think it's about our relationship to consumerism, but I don't think it's about minimalism, having less. So less is not more for you. I think it can be. I don't think it has to be. I think a house, a house crowded with stuff can have a, a healthy relationship to consumerism. And I think a minimalist home like mine can have an unhealthy relationship to consumerism, which I do. So I think that it's actually not about the the amount of things. And that's why I'm giving this a two, uh, two whisks down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally agree. I think that, you know, it's not about the amount of stuff that you own. It's about why you buy stuff and why you hang on to it. You know, are you hanging on to your own garbage like I am? Well, maybe it should be time for you to give the world your garbage. Um, and, you know, I do think that we should be asking ourselves 
how much will I use this when you buy something? And how does it make me, you know, it, it's actually even pointless to ask yourself, how is it going to make me feel? Cause you don't know. But anyway, don't watch the documentary. It's not very good. Or watch it. If you're looking to watch something bad. <laughs> and, um, so we live to search another day for how to be. Amen, sister. Boats beat back <laughs> against the current <laughs> ceaselessly. All righty. All righty. Bye, Matt. Bye, Roar. Bye.